each one of us and that his the word of god will be plain made plain for each one of us so we can understand your word lord bless us tonight we invite your presence now in jesus name amen amen so now we are going to have our song service our first song is number 15 it's in the hymnal there is hymnal in front of you number one five my maker and my king to thee my all i owe thy sovereign bounty is the spring when all my blessing flow thy sovereign Oh, let thy grace inspire my soul with strength divine. Let every word and each desire and all my days be thine. Let every word and each desire my own my days be thine. Our next song is number 34. Turn your pages to number 34.
And now we're going to have our team song. Let's all stand. And let's all sing together. Our, our team song, Seek Ye First. solemn time of our worship and at this time we're going to ask us to meet in groups of twos as we are going to have prayer and for those online if you're home meet with your family your friends if you're by yourself just join us together as we need to pray this time we're going to pray for those who we have invited we're going to pray for the for the holy spirit to move upon the hearts of all of us our visitors, our families, our friends, as we worship tonight, pray for the evangelist, pray for his voice, and as any other, um, any other request that comes up, the, the Holy Spirit impresses you to pray for this meeting, we're going to pray for about five minutes, so wherever you are, just join with somebody. If you're a family, don't join with your family, join with your friends, sister. Clarice said, don't join your husband. Your husband will join somebody else. And so on. We'll join someone whom you have never prayed before with. Let's pray. And I'm going to see if I see anybody here that I have not prayed with yet and join in prayer. So at this time, let's kneel for prayer as you find, quickly find somebody to pray with.
Shall we just have a closing prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful time that we could invite your presence into our hearts and to prepare us for the message. We just pray that you hasten the steps of those who are coming and be with all those who are online with us this evening. We thank you for how you're going to bless us with the message. Open our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Hello everyone. Hello. Who's ready for who's ready for today's quiz session? You excited? I know I am. <laughs> so the way how this is gonna work is we have three questions and the first person who answers um, one question correctly gets a prize. So <laughs> we don't know, maybe. <laughs> so there's three of them. One for each person, not for like one person. That's how it's gonna go. And we'll start off with the first question. Raise their hand. Okay, first person to raise their hand. So first question is, what is the name meaning of Daniel? You. That is correct. Good job. <laughs> uh, second question. What chapter is at the center of the book of Daniel? Like, what is the main theme? Chapter seven. Chapter seven, yes. And what is the main theme? So, the question. Yeah, so it's a two-part question. It's uh, what is the center of the book of Daniel and what is the theme of that central chapter? That is correct. <laughs> Yay, good job. And the last question is, what are the three meanings or aspects of the biblical view of the judgment? That is correct. <laughs> Thank you for your participation. Hello, everyone. Um, Usually when you have a special music, you're expecting to have something really special. But um, in regards to Pastor G's presentation, I think this song fits in nicely, so I, I chose to sing it. Look for the way marks.
Thank you very much. Look for the way marks. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Well, once again, we'd like to greet each of you who are here this evening, and as well as for those who are joining online throughout this series, I will be addressing you as citizens of the kingdom of God. So, citizens of the kingdom of God, good evening. Evening. Thank you very much. Really want to appreciate and thank you for your presence uh, here at this uh, sanctuary this evening, as well as for those for our viewers online. Thank you for joining. Your presence is highly appreciated, and we want to acknowledge uh, the time that you had um, intentionally set apart to be part of our evangelistic series um, tonight, and also I believe in the upcoming um, presentation, upcoming sessions in the following days. We have began our evangelistic series yesterday morning um, in the divine service. Uh, we had looked at Daniel chapter yesterday morning, chapter two, right, where we saw the statue, the vision, the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. And basically, we could, I could summarize the message in chapter two as God giving us the exam questions ahead of time, meaning God has foreknowledge of things that will happen. And along with that foreknowledge, he, has, he gives us what we call divine providence. He gives us the comfort that we need. He gives us the assurance that we need, as well as he gives us a, a motivation to prepare for what is to come, to prepare for the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not only a future reality, but it is also a present, the not yet and the now. Awesome. And yesterday afternoon, we've looked at Daniel, a parallel chapter of Daniel chapter 2, which is Daniel chapter seven. chapter 7. Yes, that chapter 7. And if I could summarize chapter 7 in one word, it would not be those crazy beasts we have, but it would be judgment. Judgment is at the center of chapter 7. In fact, I would even say judgment is at the center of the entire book of Daniel. Because as one of the questions um, that was asked in our quiz session, Daniel, the word, the name Daniel itself means God is my judge. Yes. And I have shared the point that despite the negative connotations that we often have regarding judgment today, despite the fearful, the anxious ideas that is often mixed with the idea of judgment we have today. 
the biblical idea of judgment is different. Okay? In fact, we should not, I believe we should not bring our idea of judgment and put it as the, the biblical idea of judgment. So we have to explore exactly what the Bible says about the judgment. And we've seen that in chapter 7, we do, not, do we have to fear the judgment or no? No, we do not have to fear the judgment because the text says very clearly, the little horn will be persecuting the saints of the Most High, would be speaking words against the Most High, doing all those terrible things. But the text says clearly that judgment shall be made in favor of the saints. Judgment will be made in favor of the saints. And most of all, we do not have to fear the judgment because who is our judge? Jesus Christ is our judge. So as long as we choose to stand by His side, be on His side, as long as we choose not to represent ourselves, but be behind Christ in the judgment, then we do not have to fear the judgment. Today, I've entitled the message for tonight as The Plan and the Plot. The plan and the plot. Yesterday morning, we've looked at Daniel chapter 2. Yesterday afternoon, we have looked at Daniel chapter 7. Today, this evening, we'll be mainly on the mysterious, I'd say, mysterious or enigmatic chapter of Daniel chapter 8. Okay, so we, have, we looked at chapter 2, we've looked at chapter 7, and we've looked at chapter 8. As we go through today's presentation, we would see that Daniel chapter 8 is very, very related. I would say there are quite some elements of parallelism with chapter 7, but there's also some break in parallelism. Okay? So it is highly connected with chapter 7, but also it is quite different in some aspects. Okay? So we will look at Daniel chapter 8. The plan the plot, and I've entitled, uh, uh, subtitled it as the blueprint of the kingdom of God. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, as we now explore your word, explore the plan that you have for us, the blueprint you have prepared for us so that we may be part of your kingdom. Lord, we ask for understanding, we ask for enlightenment, we ask for wisdom and understanding as we explore this important and crucial chapter of Daniel. Amen. How many of you, let me start with a question, how many of you have been to a banquet? Yes, I see some hands. Okay, yeah. How many of you enjoy banquets? You know, those fancy banquets like that. Yes, we have those nice layout of tables sometimes. Well, the table up there is, is the long one, but sometimes we have the, the, the fancy round ones, right? We have nicely organized tables um, covered with beautiful tablecloths, with well-organized chairs, and on those tables we have neatly organized plates, you know, cutleries, glasses, okay? And along, of course, along with the banquet, you know, it's, it's not fun if we just have food, right? We also need some good music, too. Yeah, some good music. Probably it would be even better if there's a special program too, so we would need a, a very humorous and an eloquent MC, right? The master of ceremony, yeah, MC. And we also need um, some, some nice program, maybe some games, some participation. I don't know if, you, if you'd like to dance too, maybe some dance. Yes? Okay. I'd love to dance, but I guess not now. <laughs> All right. When we think about these kinds of nicely plan, banquet. Does a banquet come naturally? Does it come out randomly? Does a banquet work like, oh, I want to have a banquet next Sunday, and does it pop up? That would be great if it, if it does, but apparently it doesn't, right? It requires some careful planning, organization, right? Perhaps if, you've, if you have any, if any one of you had an experience where you had planned for a banquet or any great event, we know clearly that any great event, something like a banquet, would need what we call something like a blueprint or a plan. 
that clearly outlines the small, small details that need to be in place. So in the case of a, blank, of a banquet, you, the, the organizer of the, of the banquet would need a blueprint, an idea, a plan of how, where, how to set up the tables. How will the program be? What kind of food will be served? At what time will the food be served? When will the program begin? When will the program end? Who will run the program? And all those things. Well, I must say, a well-organized, a nicely planned banquet is just like the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a, a divine celebration where all of us, where we are welcome to enjoy in the banquet, where we are welcome to feast in the table of grace. And just like any great event, the kingdom of God has or needs a carefully planned, carefully organized blueprint for it to be successful. And that is where what we call the sanctuary services in the Bible. The sanctuary services, that is when it comes to scene. The sanctuary service is just like a blueprint, an organizing plan, all the details, a blueprint for the kingdom of God. Now you may ask, Pastor G, how, how, does, the, how does the sanctuary, how does the Old Testament sanctuary work or function as a blueprint for the kingdom of God? How is it's the sanctuary connected, related to the kingdom of God. Well, let's take a look at the, a brief list, let's take a look at the Old Testament sanctuary and see how it relates to the kingdom of God. In the biblical sanctuary, in the Old Testament times, we had what we call a sanctuary, or some people would call it a tabernacle. In the Old Testament times, the biblical sanctuary, do you think it was a busy place or was it a calm place? Calm, yes, calm too. I would say it was a little busy. Yes. At times, I would say every single day. Every single day, something was going on. Every single day. 365 days a year. Every single day, the biblical sanctuary had something going on. It was a busy place. There is what we call the daily services, meaning services that were conducted every single day. Okay. Daily services. Now, um, on yes, yesterday morning, we, we learned a, a short Hebrew phrase at the end of times. So today I'm going to teach you another, this time a, a word. It's, it's even easier as what it means, the daily services. Okay? In Hebrew, it's called hatamid. Can you repeat after me? Hatamid. Yes, hatamid. The ha, word ha is a definite article which means the. Tamid means, literally means continual or daily. Okay, so hatamid means the daily literally, or the the continuum. What is it called? You forgot already. Very good. Hatamid. Okay. So there was, in, this, in the Old Testament sanctuary, there was what we call the hatamid, the daily services that took place every single day without an exception. Okay. Every single day in the Old Testament sanctuary, the daily services, or the hatamid, took place. We had at the Near the entrance of the, of the sanctuary, what we call the altar of burnt offering. Every single day, daily and continually, there was a burnt offering that was burnt. This is one aspect of the hatamid, the daily sanctuary services. Every single day, there was also behind the altar of burnt offering, what we call a bronze laver. And every single day, it was refilled with water. Water was continually present in the bronze labor. It was used for clean, cl cleaning, cleansing. So the presence of the water in the, in the labor also is a part of the daily services. The? Ha, tamid. Very good. 
Every single day, also, inside the compartment, in the first compartment, there was what we call a table. There was a table, table of shoe bread, where every single day and continually, there were 12 loaves of bread. Bread was present, continually present on the table. On the opposite side of the table of shoe bread, there was what we call the menorah, or the golden lampstand, the, the candlesticks. And every single day, Tamid, tamid, continually, daily, the golden lampstand, the menorah were lighted. It was lighted. In addition to that, at the end of the first compartment, there was what we call the altar of incense, where the priest would light, burn incense every single day, continually, daily. And the fragrance, the smoke of the incense would spread out to the entire sanctuary and eventually through, throughout the entire camp of the Israelites. So the daily services, the Hatamid, took place every single day. No exception. Every single day. Hence, the Hatamid, the daily or the, the continual. Without exception, it took place. Now you may be asking, why? Why were these services? Why were the Hatamid conducted daily? What do, what, do they, what do they mean? What was the purpose of these Hatamid, the daily services? Well, I must say the Hatamid, the daily services, is important because it points to a very, 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 very important reality. Every single part, every single aspect of the entire Hatamid, the daily services, it was like a finger, it was a direction, an arrow pointing towards a very, very, very important reality, which is the daily, the continual, the moment-by-moment -moment ministry of Christ. I need to emphasize this. Not the once in a while ministry of Christ. Not the I'll do it when I feel like ministry of Christ. Not the I'll do it for you when you are good ministry of Christ. But the daily, continual, unending, everyday ministry of Christ. We've seen We've seen the, the, the altar of sacrifice. The, the continual burning of the lamb on this altar of sacrifice, it pointed to, it, it, it represented or it symbolized the, the, the consecration of the people of Israel as a whole. It pointed to the daily, everyday, daily continual consecration of the Israel nation to God and their continual Continual daily dependence on the atoning blood of Christ. Leslie Harding, he's, a, he's a, an Adventist scholar and an author, he says, When at any minute of the day or night a soul was in need of forgiveness, the blood of the Lamb was there to provide it. When at any minute of the day and night, meaning continuously, when a soul was needing forgiveness, the blood of lamb was there to provide for it. And the altar, the sacrifice that was continually, daily burnt on it, pointed towards that. The labor as well. The continual presence of the water in the bronze labor was for the washing and for the cleansing of the priests and the worshipers who were involved in the killing of the sacrifices and offering it on the, on the altar of burnt offering. The people, including the priests, the Israelites were in need, constant need, daily constant need of the supply of the water of life so that they may be kept clean. And when one needs cleansing, when one needs to be cleansed, this points to the idea that Jesus, the water of life, is always, continuously, daily, 
He is always there. The table of shewbread as well. The table of shewbread in the holy place constantly had 12 loaves of bread. And the presence, the constant presence of the bread was a reminder for the Israelites of the sustaining presence of Jesus, the bread of life. And that presence of Jesus was available to all. And Jesus, the bread of life, he was always there. He was tamid there. He was always there to provide heavenly, divine nourishment for his people through his word. The menorah as well, the golden candlestick, which was continuously lighted every single day. It pointed and it represents the unending, the unceasing illumination, the light that Jesus himself gives, who himself is the light of the world. And when one was in a dark pathway, it is none other than Jesus and his word that would continuously shine upon our dark paths. No wonder the psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And the altar of incense as well, where it was continuously burned by the priest to, to create and exhale sweet fragrance to fill not only the sanctuary, but the entire camp of the Israelites. It was to remind the people that Jesus, our high priest, is the one who continuously intercedes for us, pleads on our behalf, ministers for us on, on our behalf. And it is only through His faithfulness that his righteousness demonstrated in the fragrance is imparted to us. And it also points to that Jesus, our great high priest, through his continuous ministry, that our prayers are ascending and are received by God. So in this sense, the hatamid, the daily services, all aspects of the daily sanctuary services, the hatamid, were conducted for a specific reason. Every part of the hatamid, the daily, was a finger, it was, a, it was an arrow, a direction pointing towards some important aspect, which is the daily, continuous, unending, moment-by-moment -moment ministry of Jesus on our behalf. In other words, the entire sanctuary and its services is the blueprint for the kingdom of God. Not just the altar of burnt offering. Not just the fact that Jesus died for us on the cross. That is, only that is not the blueprint of the kingdom of God. That is included too. But there are other aspects. The Hatamid, from the altar of burnt offering to the laver, to the table of shewbread, to the menorah, to the altar of incense. And it is through these services that we can experience eternal life, that we can be part, we can be called rightful citizens of the kingdom of God. Hence, the sanctuary services, the Hatamid, is the blueprint of the kingdom of God. But there's, there comes a problem. There comes a problem. Because the Hatamid is the blueprint of the kingdom of God, the Hatamid comes under attack. The Hatamid, given its significance and importance, of its pointing towards the daily ministry of Christ, Satan's not going to stand still. The Hatamid comes under attack. In other words, God's plan is now is plotted against. The plan and the plot. God's sanctuary is defiled. Remember that mysterious figure we've looked at yesterday in Daniel chapter 7 that came out of the fourth beast. Yes. The little horn. Well, this little horn, I told you it's a little horn, but its activity is definitely not little. 
This little horn that appeared in Daniel chapter 7, which we explored yesterday, comes back to scene in Daniel chapter 8. This is what the little horn does. I'll be reading from Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 through 12. It says, And out of them came a little horn, and it grew up to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground, and it trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of hosts. And by him, the... There's a reason why I emphasized Hatamid. Because in many translations, it says, it's translated like as this one. This one is in the New King James Version, daily sacrifices. Or if I remember in the ESV, the English Standard Version is translated as the regular burnt offering. But if we see it in the original language in Hebrew, it's not only the sacrifice, but rather it's the hatamid. It's not only the altar of sacrifice that the little horn tramples. Does that make sense? It's not only the altar of sacrifice that the little horn tramples. It's the entire sanctuary. It's the entire Hatamid. So I would translate that, and by him, the Hatamid, the daily services from the altar of burnt offering, from the laver, from the table of shoe bread, from the lighting of the candlestick, lighting of the, uh, the altar of incense. All of them were taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the not only the sacrifices, but the tamid. Now you're getting the picture. Okay? And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this, the little horn, and prospered. Yesterday afternoon, we saw in Daniel chapter 7 that the little horn, which we as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe it points, or it represents the papacy. He had persecuted the saints of the Most High, it had spoken words against the Most High. It had changed times and laws. And that is parallel. The, the parallel idea is reflected in Daniel chapter 8. The same little horn, it tramples, it threw down, tramples the host, some of the stars, and it even took away the hatamid. Not just the offering, not just this burnt offering, but the entire hatamid. So, how, historically, how did the papacy, how did the little horn take away or trample the Hatamid? Or in other words, how did the little horn defile the sanctuary? Well, the little horn took away the continual burnt offering, the Tamid burnt offering, and the continual presence of the water in the bronze labor. We've seen that the continual burnt offering, the daily burnt offering, symbolized man's continual dependence on the blood of Christ. And we've also seen that the continual presence of the water in the labor represents the constant supply of the water of life that is needed for our cleansing. How did the little horn take this away? These were taken away and trampled, defiled by the little horn, through its teaching, and in fact, even forcing people to look and depend not on Jesus Christ, but for them, the vicar of Christ, the representative of Christ, and to trust not in Christ, but in the vicar of Christ for the atonement of their sins and for their cleansing. We've also seen that the little horn took away the continual, the daily continual presence of the bread on the table, as well as the continual, the daily lighting of the menorah, of the golden candlestick. We've seen that the continual presence of the bread on the table of shoe bread represents and symbolizes Christ, the bread of life, and our need of constant dependence on the mediation of Christ for our physical food and on His Word. And we've seen that the constant lighting, 
The daily lighting of the menorah points to, represents Christ, who is the light of the world, and our continual, our daily need for God's word. How did the little horn take this away? The little horn took these away by substituting the continual mediation of Christ with the mediation of human priests. Claiming that the human priest had the power to create Christ in what they call the Eucharist or the Mass. How did, how did, the, how did the, the Hatamid, how was the Hatamid taken away? When the little horn suppressed the scriptures, forced them and took them away from the people. The scriptures, which is supposed to be our bread of life, our light to our path. And the little horn denied the scriptures from the people and in fact subjected the authority of the scriptures to the authority of the vicar of Christ or even to their traditions or to their creeds. The little horn also took away the Continual, the daily presence of the, the incense, the altar of incense, as well as the fragrance. The, we've seen that the continual burning, the, 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 um, the, the continual burning of the incense and the continual presence of the smoke, not only in the sanctuary, but in the entire camp of the Israelites, represents Christ's merits. And his continual, his daily moment by moment intercession for us. And it is only through his perfect righteousness that we can be claimed as righteous. How did the little horn take this away? It substituted and it demolished the high priestly mediation of Christ by authorizing human priests who claim that they can hear people's confession and that they have the authority that on their righteousness they can forgive sins. So Hatamid, the entire sanctuary services they all point to what Christ does for us so that we may become and be part of citizens of his kingdom. And because of this importance, no wonder why the little horn has to attack and has been attacking the Hatamid, the daily services. The sanctuary is under attack, is defiled. God's plan has been plotted against. Yes, the Hatamid, the sanctuary has been under attack. The sanctuary has been defiled. But God has a comeback. Do you believe that? God has a comeback. He has a plan. Daniel chapter 8, 13 and 14. Probably two of the most important verses that shapes Seventh-day Adventist identity. It says, Then I heard a holy one speaking. This is Daniel in vision, and he's conversing with, uh, with, uh, with the angel. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long? Until when or how long? In Hebrew, Admatai. How long will the vision be concerning the? Yes, very good. Concerning the? Yes, not just the sacrifice. Concerning the Hatamid, the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to the trampled, to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, for 2,300 days. Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. It has been defiled. But for two, after 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I want you to take note of the, the number there, 2,300 days. 200. 2,300. We will dig deeper into this on Wednesday as we explore the next topic. Today we're going to focus mainly on the idea of the sanctuary being cleansed.
What does it mean for the sanctuary to be cleansed? Where do we find the answer to the question, what does it mean for the sanctuary to be cleansed? The answer is found in one very crucial chapter, the Old Testament. I would even say the exact center of what we call the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. By the way, in chapter 8, we didn't cover it, but if you look at it at your own time, at the beginning of chapter 8, we have the appearance of two animals. In contrast to chapter 7, where there were four animals, four, four beasts, I told you chapter 7 and 8, there are parallels, but there's also a break in parallel. One of the entities, as, we've seen, as I've told you yesterday, chapter 7 is written in Aramaic. It's still in Aramaic. In chapter 8, there's a break. It's in Hebrew now. Chapter 7, we had four beasts, four animals, representing four kingdoms. And out of the fourth, there comes the little horn. Chapter 8, instead of four, we just have two. The two animals are, we see in chapter 8, verse 3 and verse 5, a ram. Daniel says, and behold, I saw one ram. And a few verses later, there comes another animal, a goat. A ram and a goat. Ram and a goat. These two animals, in the context of the sanctuary, they appear together only in one other place in the scripture. At a very sp special occasion. Can you guess? Yes. Leviticus chapter 16. Scholars say that Le Leviticus chapter 16 is at the chiastic, is at the center of the Torah. Remember I, yesterday I told you that in the Hebrew mindset, they put the important in the middle. We have Genesis, we have Deuteronomy, we have Exodus, we have Numbers, we have Leviticus in the, in the middle. And in, in fact, even in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16 is at the very center. Chapter 16 talks about what we know as the Day of Atonement or as the Hebrews call it, the Yom Kippur. The Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, which was celebrated, which took place on the 10th day of the seventh month in the Jewish calendar. It is only in the context of the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16, where we see the cleansing of the sanctuary, and we, where we see those two animals, a ram and a goat, appearing together. So when Daniel chapter 8 talks about a ram and a goat and the cleansing of the sanctuary, clearly it is pointing back towards none other than Leviticus chapter 16. What happens in the Day of Atonement? So all throughout the year in the Israelite sanctuary, the sanctuary would be defiled, would be made dirty by the blood of the sacrifices that were killed every single day. And the Day of Atonement, the, the, the seventh day of the tenth, the te sorry, the tenth day of the seventh month, the Day of Atonement, it was the special day where the sanctuary would be cleansed. It was a once a year celebration. In contrast to the Hatamid, which was daily, every single day, the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur was a once a year cleansing of the sanctuary. What happened on the Day of Atonement? We see the appearance of a ram and a goat together. On the Day of Atonement, a ram would be offered as a burnt offering to start with. And after some rituals, two goats, we see a ram and a goat, two goats would be chosen. One goat for the Lord, one goat for what the text in Leviticus say, for Azazel, or what we call as the scapegoat. The Lord's goat will be offered as a sacrifice. The goat, the scapegoat, the goat for Azazel, the sins of the people of Israel will be placed upon Azazel. And the goat would not be killed, would be sent away, far, far away from the camp of the Israelites. 
signifying, representing the ultimate cleansing, the ultimate eradication of sin and defilement from the camp of the Israelites. We may ask, what is the meaning, purpose of the Day of Atonement? Here, chapter 7. Understanding chapter 8 in chapter 7 would help. Let's review chapter 7 and chapter 8. Yesterday, we've seen that in chapter 7, we saw four beasts, right? Four beasts, four animals, representing four different kingdoms. And chronologically, after that, out of the fourth beast, there came a little horn. Little horn became busy, speaking words against the Most High, trampling, oh, sorry, um, persecuting the saints of the Most High, changing times and law. And then chronologically, after that, what came? The judgment. And judgment was made in our favor. Same pattern, parallel. Daniel 8, we see beasts. This time too, but we see animals, kingdoms. And then comes again the little horn. Little horn gets busy. Trampling the sanctuary. Getting rid of the hatamid. And then after that, what happens? The cleansing of the sanctuary. What that means is that judgment and the cleansing of the sanctuary corresponds to the same thing. The other day we saw that the heavenly judgment in Daniel 7 that takes place in heaven, we do not have to fear the judgment because it is made in our favor. It is because Christ, who is our judge, is the one who will be judging us. And as long as we are on his side, we do not have to fear the judgment. In fact, I've even made a claim that we can even look forward to the judgment because it will be a time of justification, time of deliverance, and a time of vindication. It's the same thing, same idea in Daniel chapter 8 regarding the cleansing of the sanctuary. Throughout history, God's people have been persecuted by the little horn because of God's sanctuary, the blueprint of the kingdom of God, the blueprint that points towards, that leads towards the kingdom of God. And God's people have been persecuted by it. The hatamid, the daily services, what Christ does for us every single day was taken away or temporarily trampled by the little horn. And it is that hatamid that allows us for us to be citizens of the kingdom of God. Dear friends, Manuel Church members and also our guests want to present to you the good news in Daniel chapter 8 today. Christ, our high priest, what is he doing now? He is currently cleansing the sanctuary. He's in his last phase of his high priestly ministry. Just as how the Israelite high priest is making atonement, cleansing, and interceding on behalf of the entire camp of the Israelites on the Day of Atonement, on the Yom Kippur, Christ, who is our high priest, he is currently cleansing interceding for us, cleansing the sanctuary on our behalf. He is restoring the Hatamid. He is restoring the sanctuary. The author of Hebrews says, consequently he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Daniel chapter 7, we saw that Christ is our judge. Daniel 8 makes it clear that Christ, who is our judge, is also our high priest, is also our cleanser, our purifier, our mediator, our intercessor, who is interceding on our behalf. Therefore, just as we do not have to fear the judgment, chapter 7, do we have to fear the Day of Atonement? I don't think you're sure. Do we, just as we don't have to fear the Day of Judgment in chapter 7, do we have to he fear the Day of Atonement? No. Now we may ask, how? How can a judge also be our advocate, our intercessor? How is that possible? In our understanding today in the 21st century, a judge cannot be 
our intercessor. In other words, our, a judge cannot be our lawyer. That's not fair. We do not see that instance in, in our modern day courts. Here's an interesting fact. And I think this, for me, this is exactly the gospel. In the Jewish judicial system, in the Jewish mindset, attorneys or lawyers, they're not present. Attorneys meaning referring to our current understanding of attorneys. The reason why? Here's a quote I found from the ministry magazine. Martin Weber says, witnesses of the crime pressed the charges while the judge promoted, promoted the case of the defendant. Biased in favor of the acquittal. The judge promoted the case of the defendant. Biased. Apparently, the judge is biased. Just like how we remember judgment is made in favor of the saints. The judge promotes the case of the defendant biased in favor of the acquittal. Only when overwhelmed by evidence would the judge abandon his defense of the accused and reluctantly pronounce condemnation. What this means in the, in the, in the Hebrew judicial system, there's no lawyer. The lawyer is the judge. The judge is the lawyer. And the role of the judge is to as much as possible protect the accused. Only when overwhelmed by evidence that the accused has actually done wrong, then the judge will not happily say, oh, my case is done. No. But reluctantly pronounce condemnation. Dear friends, Daniel 7, we saw Christ our judge. Christ our judge is our advocate, is our lawyer in Daniel chapter 8. Can you imagine our judge who gives the verdict, who gives the final statement? Same judge is also our advocate is also the one who is interceding, who is mediating, who is pleading on behalf of, behalf of us, who is defending us. Today I want to make an appeal to you. Christ, our high priest, is doing his job for you and for me. He's not only our judge, but he's our judge who defends us. He's our judge, but also our high priest, as well as our advocate. Will you choose to take Christ as your judge and as your advocate? We've seen that all the sanctuary services, the, the entire Hatamid is like a blueprint, a well-organized plan that points towards what God, what Christ has done for us every single day so that we may be part of His kingdom. That is the purpose of the Hatamid, the sanctuary services. And the devil knows that. He has to attack that. So throughout history, the little horn has been trampling that, has been defiling the sanctuary. But there's good news. There will be the cleansing of the sanctuary. In fact, the cleansing is going on now. Christ, our judge, is at work making an intercession for us, mediating for us, advocating for us. This is the gospel in the book of Daniel, my friends. Christ, our judge, is also our high priest, our advocate. Today, he is extending his arms, waiting for you to make a commitment, a decision. Do you choose to take Christ as your judge? but also as your advocate, as your lawyer, who defends you. This is the gospel of Daniel chapter 9, chapter 8. This is what allows us to be part 
of the kingdom of God. The hatamid, the daily ministry of Christ, is the blueprint for the kingdom of God. May God bless you. Let's all stand for our closing team song. Father, we thank you for your son, for his daily ministry on our behalf. Father, we also thank you for the good news, the gospel, that you are cleansing the sanctuary, you are restoring the hatamid for us. Father, we thank you for being our judge, but also at the same time our lawyer our advocate, our defender. Pray that as we go through this series and as we explore the book of Daniel, as we explore how we can be part and live out the kingdom of God in our lives, that you would grant us the power, the presence of your Holy Spirit, and the hope that we need as we live out to be citizens of your kingdom. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, our ultimate and great high priest, ministering on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. Thank you very much for your participation, for joining us this evening. Join us once again on our next session, on our fourth presentation, which will be on Wednesday evening. Wednesday evening. So today's Sunday. We have Mondays and Tuesday off. We will meet again Wednesday evening, same time at 7.30 p.m. And we will be exploring what is, for me, the most detailed and greatest prophecy in the Bible. If you think that Daniel chapter 2 was a pretty fancy, pretty accurate prophecy, it's not bad. But there's more coming. We'll look at Daniel chapter 9. So please join us once again Wednesday evening at 7.30. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.